it's a recurring uh, series of trainings for time to come. Tonight's training is going to be on unsafe housing conditions and like things such as warrant of habitability. And so we're going to be going over, you know, what do you look for when you're looking at an apartment? What are some signs that maybe there's things wrong, that things need to be addressed, and how do you how do you recognize what those concerns are? And so this is a joint effort between Push Buffalo and Neighborhood Legal Services, um, where you know Push we're giving our like insight from doing housing work, from owning housing, and you know from all the information that we've gone through with laws and tenants and campaigns. And neighborhood legal services is giving us the, you know, their legalese expertise on, you know, different aspects of housing law, and you know, they know a lot more about how things operate in court, you know, than I personally do. And so we're happy to have a joint effort going on tonight. So I don't know if Grace and them want to just introduce themselves from neighborhood legal services. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm Jack, I'm a paralegal with Neighborhood Legal Services. Um, and then you know, I'll hand it off to um, Grace and Alyssa, um, who are both attorneys with Neighborhood Legal Services in the housing unit. And we'll get started with going over the basics of what the warranty of habitability is and what that means. Do we wanna go around and just say who we are? Definitely think Grace and Melissa, you should introduce yourself just so people understand sure. who you are a little more. Yes. Make sure everybody knows you. Sorry, I skipped that part. So as Jack said, I'm a lawyer over at Neighborhood Legal Services. Um, and I've been working there for a good long time. I'm also a, a West Side resident um, and live just a couple of blocks from Push. So familiar with some of the issues that we have here in our in our neighborhood. Um, so just wanted to say welcome to everyone and thanks for joining us on a Friday night. And Alyssa's next. Yep, um, my name is Alyssa, obviously. Um, I'm also a staff attorney with Neighborhood Legal Services um, in the housing unit. Um, I previously worked at different um, housing nonprofits and I live in Buffalo, so definitely interested in these issues, um, making sure that we get the word out. Um, and so this is the four of us that are, you know, doing the training tonight. Um, as we have today's agenda, so we'll start with the warranty of habitability. You know, what is it? You know, what does it actually mean? And then uh, we'll follow that up with what violates that warrant. You know, what conditions, you know, violate that? What do they look like? Some examples, a few visuals, which will then go into what to look for when renting and kind of like how those visuals and how those issues may show up in what ways they may be, in what ways uh, to protect yourself when going in so you can know what to expect um, out of yourself and out of your landlord so you can bring it up when looking at the apartment that like, hey, this paint doesn't look so right, you know, and kind of have that conversation before you get in there and then the landlord tries to say it's your fault that like there's rodent droppings or there's whatever when in actuality there were signs before you even moved in. And we're gonna finish with the impacts of COVID-19 and how this health crisis has impacted tenants, how it's impacted housing, and some of the um, concerns moving forward that COVID has left us with. So I think with that, it'll be, you know, I'll hand it off to Jack, Alyssa, and Grace. Thanks, Angel. No problem. All right, so um, just starting off very basically, um, this is just an explanation of what the warranty of habitability actually means. Um, the warranty of habitability is a guarantee in New York State um, that landlords should address any conditions that threaten the life, health, or safety of tenants. Um, and this is true regardless of whether or not tenants have a written lease. Um, Tenants can raise this as a defense in a non-payment eviction proceeding, um, and they can also bring in what's called an affirmative warranty of habitability claim against a landlord um, in a case where the landlord has not initiated anything, but the tenant wants the court to address the issues with the landlord. Um, it's important to note that the warranty of habitability doesn't cover every single condition. So 
things that are really more cosmetic. Um, there's some examples on the slide. If there's um, maybe a bad paint job or dirty walls, things like that, those might not necessarily um, implicate the warranty of habitability, but we'll give some examples of what does on the next slide. Okay, so a lot of these are probably um, pretty obvious things that you would think of as threats to health or safety. Um, things like frozen pipes, no heat, no hot water, um, infestations of mice, rodents, insects, um, serious electrical issues or plumbing issues. Um, also things, um, and we'll have some photos of these later on in the presentation, but things that you might not necessarily know to look out for. Um, so different signs of lead-based paint. Um, there are different things to look out for, like chipping and peeling, um, certain issues with flooring where it becomes unsafe if there's a lack of proper lighting, um, insecure doors that don't lock fully, broken windows, a lack of handrails, um, anything that um, might be required for safety that's lacking on the outside of a unit, um, and there's other things as well. Um, this isn't a fully inclusive list. So I just wanted to jump in and talk about um, criminal activity because actually it's sort of interesting that um, criminal activity could fall under the warranty of habitability, but it's not in all situations. So like if you're walking down the street and someone holds you up in front of your house, that's probably not covered under the warranty of habitability. But if you have a window that doesn't lock in your back, you know, in the backyard and you live on the first floor, let's say, and the landlord knows that the window doesn't lock right? because, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, but because you tell the landlord every time he or she comes to pick up the rent, you know, I live on the first floor apartment, um, my neighbors have been broken into before, the window just slides right open, I'm really worried about my safety and that I could get broken into. In a situation like that where you've let the landlord know that it's a problem, you've let the landlord know that, you know, there, there's there been crime in your neighborhood, so you could reasonably foresee, that's the legal term, you know, you, you could guess that bad things could happen if that window isn't fixed. In those situations, a landlord could be um, considered to have violated uh, the warranty of habitability because the landlord didn't fix the window. So it doesn't apply to all situations where you're a crime victim, but it would apply to situations where the landlord doesn't make necessary repairs and you let the landlord know. Um, and you live in a situation where, you know, it, it, where this could happen. So I pass the baton back to you. <laughs> Forgot to unmute myself. Um, so for uh, tenants who are dealing with conditions in their housing um, that they think might violate the warranty of habitability that threaten life, health, or safety, um, it's important, number one, to make sure that you let the landlord know um, and also document your efforts to communicate your concerns to the landlord. Um, so, you know, you might try telling the landlord verbally first, but if they don't respond, you'll certainly want to follow up by doing that in writing. Um, you'll want to let the landlord know in writing the previous times that you tried to tell the landlord about the problem, um, what the problem is specifically, if you know what caused it, um, and the effect that it's having on you, um, and also a reasonable request for a time frame when you expect the problem to be fixed. Um, and that'll depend on the severity of the issue and the severity of the effect on the tenant. Um, so you'll want to keep a copy of that letter um, because if you do end up in court down the line regarding a non-payment or other issues, you want to have documentation that you did what you were supposed to do in telling the landlord about the issue um, first and foremost. So um, sometimes tenants get to a point where they have told the landlord about the problem. Um, they may have even put it in writing to the landlord and the landlord might still not be willing to do anything about it. Um, while we would not necessarily advise tenants to do this, and just generally speaking, um, in certain circumstances, it, it's appropriate for the tenants to take the step um, to withhold the rent. Um, but like I said, that's not always appropriate. So you want to make sure that you're doing 
um, all of the required things so that if it does end up in court that you have um, the argument to make uh, and that you've done everything properly to set that argument up. Um, so if you do decide, if a tenant does decide to withhold their rent, um, they should have first notified the landlord about their intent to do so after the landlord failed to make repairs. Um, that money should also be set aside um, and it should be available in the event that it goes to court or the landlord does eventually make the repairs. Um, we're going to talk a lot more specifically about withholding on the training that's coming up in a few weeks on June 12th. Um, and if anybody has specific questions about your own situation in the meantime, um, please feel welcome to contact our agency, Neighborhood Legal Services, um, at 8470650, and we can give you specific advice about your own circumstances. Um, calling the Health Department in Buffalo and the building inspectors is also an option. Um, there is a risk in doing that, even now um, where there's a moratorium on eviction it's still possible that the health department or building inspectors might say that the conditions are so unsafe um, that you would have to vacate the unit and those vacate orders are still in effect at this time. Um, but if, as long as it's not a situation so bad that they would order you to vacate, they can provide um, really helpful documentation of the conditions and they can also pursue uh, landlords in court on those matters. Um, and we'll have um, similarly a more in-depth training on those things on Friday, July 10th. Grace, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on to that before we go to questions. Um, no, why don't we see what people want to ask and we'll go from there. Does anyone have any questions? I'm gonna unmute everybody. You know, why don't you just unmute yourselves as you, uh, as you want to ask questions. Um, this is Lucy. Um, I know of a lady, she, she often talks and says that she was in, a par in a, an apartment, she has told her landlord numerous times, and she has been, I believe, since, he, since November with either no hot water or no water at all, because he has failed to fix the pipes. Now, if she withholds the rent, does she have to put it one in an escrow account? And what should she be doing? Because she's talked to him already. I don't know if she's given him a written, but I know that she's uh, very vocal. So the rent doesn't have to go into an escrow account. It just should be in a safe place, um, somewhere where she can get to it if she needs to get to it. Um, it shouldn't be spent. Um, and then in terms of what to do, yeah, definitely the, the tenant should um, talk to the landlord, but also do something so that she can prove that she did talk to the landlord. So if she communicates with the landlord by text and she could do screenshots of those texts, that would work. If she uh, communicates with the landlord by email, you know, and she keeps those emails, that would work. Or if mm -hmm. neither of those um, happen, she could write a letter to the landlord and um, keep a copy of that letter. Um, the next step, and we'll talk about this, as Alyssa said, more in detail on another evening, but um, calling the health department is definitely a possibility. But if there's no water in the unit, um, there is a chance that the health department or, or a court would say that she couldn't live there anymore. And that's something that she should know when she calls the health department. Um, if there's no water because the landlord's not paying the water bill, the city of Buffalo has agreed to turn the water back on for anyone who's had a water shut off during the, you know, this, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, there may be monies available for repairs to water lines right now. Those are really expensive and I couldn't tell you for sure that that money is available or the landlord would qualify, but, um, but that's a possibility as well. So if the water got shut off because the landlord didn't pay the bill, um, we can get you more information about calling the water company, but the person you know could call the water company and the water company would turn it back on. It sounds like it's more complicated than that, though. Yeah, I think so, too. But I'll, I'll let her know. And uh, like I said, she's very verbal. Um, and one last thing with regard to, to your services. I know that when there's limited people to do the work, 
sometimes when you're the only game in town, you, you tend to have a lot of uh, um, a lot of people coming at you. What is like your waiting list for people in terms of housing issues? We don't actually have a waiting list right now. Um, so normally we're in court many days a week. Um, but as Alyssa mentioned, the courts aren't really doing much work right now. Um, mm -hmm. So we are in some ways less busy because we're, you know, a lot of times people can't reach us because we don't answer the phone when we're in court, but we're not going to court. Um, and so people should feel free to just give us a call and there's really very little wait right now. Oh, that's excellent. Um, and I'm sorry, um, any bilingual people on staff? Van is speaking. I didn't hear what you said, I'm sorry. Oh, I said, do you have any Spanish speaking um, oh, people available? Absolutely, yes, we have Spanish speaking people on staff and we also use something called language lines. So um, if you don't speak Spanish, or, you know, if Spanish or English are not your first language, then we can um, use an interpreter through language line and um, we can communicate with anyone. Okay, beautiful, uh, thank you so much. Oh, you're yeah, right. our main line number is staffed with uh, Spanish speaking receptionists. Um, there's an option when you call in the mm -hmm. press, I believe it's just pressing two and you'll be directed to someone who speaks Spanish. Beautiful, I'll let them know. I'll let some folks know. I also just want to note um, that people can go to nls.org and there's the phone number for our 24 hour hotline as well as the regular number that we do um, just for regular business hour um, intakes. Great, thank you. Any other questions on the basics of warranty adaptability? This is Jim, not a question, but I, I think uh, that kind of information needs to be spread more broadly beyond just Zoom. I'm not sure if the goal was, I see a pitch as a training, but I would have, well, not on this. I mean, I'm seeing also a way to make this a, a kind of a teaching kind of moment because of the information in there. And there are a lot of people that need to hear beyond the organizers' ears. And so I guess I'm wondering, so where else do you speak on this? Or do you, do you, do, are you talking on radio? Uh, or was it that you were, holding meetings or or and if you were holding meetings uh, is it at the beckoning of being called to a meeting or or is it that you're organizing the meeting i'll respond um so jim these trainings that we're doing like these zoom calls are being recorded that we uh -huh. disseminate them as a video of the entire um training session there's also a uh, a online file like an online um, folder where these slides are also going to be available so, so people who do have the access to it are going to be able to go online and find this exact slideshow and have this for themselves as well oh now i understand i wouldn't i wasn't sure um i wasn't sure what the setup is but i kind of come in on a different angle okay continue Thank you, Jim, though, but it's good for clarification purposes. Yeah, I also just want to add that on the same um, link where we have access to this presentation recorded and the PowerPoint, there are also some information sheets that are specific to some of the issues that we're talking about. So, for example, there's an information sheet on withholding of rent. Um, there's one on um, a warranty of habitability hearing in court. Um, so those are good resources, too, um, for people to take a look at. Any other questions that we can answer? Um, oh, let me go check the chat. Uh, so um, Jack just share, shared uh, the information that you need in order to get into the Google Drive that we were talking about. Um, so... I'll give people another few seconds if anyone wants to ask a question. Um, and 
then we'll we'll continue on. We have more information to go. So um, our next section is going to be what what you should be looking for when renting an apartment. And I thought a good place to start is just to ask the question. So feel free to drop it in the chat or unmute yourself and share. What do you think of first when you're thinking about a new apartment? What is on your mind as the criteria that you're going to want um, for the place that you're hoping to be living for for a long time? You know, I think a lot of people for my income to either initially the cost and then how many bedrooms and you know et cetera there there are. I know a lot of people that's like the first thing that they think of is I have three children. I need at least two or three bedrooms. Um, it's just me, so I only need one bedroom or maybe a studio. What is a reasonable price to pay for that kind of thing? Um, and so that's another part of doing this section is that to give people the opportunity to um, add some new things to like their checklist so that way you know they can go in and say well this is a fair price this is a good size but now let's look at the quality of the apartment before mm -hmm. we move into it yeah exactly a lot of people are looking at you know price the size and then um, you know when I'm speaking to many clients in the past they're looking a lot at the potential of a new place um, and it's important to not overlook the potential issues instead of just the potential, you know, things that you can do with the, with the space. So we're going to start off with a short little video that goes over some things that you want to make sure you don't overlook when you're going through an apartment for the first time. Um, so let me just share the audio. Rent.com presents your ultimate apartment walkthrough checklist. First, make sure the apartment is clean. Inspect the corners and under any furniture. Check the apartment for drafts or poor insulation to avoid expensive energy bills. Test the thermostat and make sure both hot and cold air work properly. Make sure there is a smoke detector in each room and test it. Check all faucets and under each sink for leaks or water damage. And while you're at it, check the water pressure and make sure there's hot water. Test that the refrigerator, oven, microwave, and dishwasher work properly. Check the closets, shelving, and cabinets for evidence of rodents. Inspect the bathroom for mold, especially in the shower. And lastly, don't forget to check for all the doors and windows securely locked. There you have it, your ultimate apartment walkthrough checklist. Happy renting! All right, so that was just kind of a quick um, walkthrough of some of the important things not to miss when looking for an apartment to rent. Um, it's really important, you know, um, smoke detectors was one that um, unfortunately I see clients often who don't have enough smoke detectors in their unit, um, and that can be a real hazard. So um, nonetheless, we put together a list with push um, of 15 items to look for. Um, I've got it here on the slides, but it's also on our Google Drive. We have it as a little slide. Um, so, you know, if you have the flyer um, and you're out to look for apartments, it might be a good idea to bring that along. Um, and we also have a security deposit checklist on there, um, which is something that you're going to want to use when it comes time to rent an apartment to make sure it's outlined what conditions are already present in the unit. So, you know, all windows and doors having a working lock, um, obviously very important for safety and security. Um, you know, especially windows if you're on a lower level apartment, you want to make sure that you can stay safe in there. Um, you know, every room having a window, um, windows being secure. A lot of times in the older homes that are common around Buffalo, the windows may not be secure. Um, it may be something that if you have a child or pets, you don't want that window coming down on them. So, you know, while these issues should be remedied by your landlord if you are living in an apartment with them. Um, you know, an ounce of 
or a bit of pretensions worth of how to cure is the um, phrase. Obviously, trying to find an apartment with as as few of these issues as possible is going to help um, prevent you from having to deal with them on later on down the line. Um, prep and shipping peeling paint. We're going to cover this some more in the training, but lead paint is a huge issue in homes around Buffalo, especially the older homes. Um, I think the year to look out for is 1978, I believe, with lead. That's when it was banned. Um, most homes and apartment buildings around Buffalo were built before then, so they have a very high likelihood of having lead paint present. And it's a, a real hazard. Uh, obviously, with small children, that's the biggest concern. Um, it can cause uh, a lot of different issues um, if it's present in children, but really, um, any lead exposure for anybody is not a good thing. Then, you know, smoke detectors, making sure all the appliances work, um, checking the hot and cold water. One thing um, I've learned over the years is you want to be able to run the sinks in the kitchen and the bathroom and then flush the toilet and turn on the tub and see if the water pressure still works. Um, it's an easy way to catch an issue that might come up later on. If you notice you can't run both sinks at the same time, you're not getting much water pressure at all. And then checking under the sink for leaks. Um, you know, making sure that you have all the appliances you need, have a sink that works in the bathroom, have hot water coming out of it. Um, you know, make sure the toilet's working, checking the heat. Um, if you're looking at an apartment and it's still the summertime, you might still wanna see, check with the landlord, make sure the furnace is on and go ahead and turn it up and make sure hot air comes out. Um, if, if it's over 80 degrees out, you might not be able to do it, but you know, it might leave you uncomfortable for the rest of the tour, but it's much better than being uncomfortable in the middle of the winter when the first cold hits and you realize that the heat is non-existent in the apartment. Um, the water heater, so ask to see the water heater in the furnace. If the landlord's saying, I'm not going to show you that, that might be a red flag. That might mean they're not really functioning. That's why he doesn't want to show you them. So you know, know where those appliances are um, and make sure that they're functioning. Having light pictures in all the rooms, that is something that the building code asks for. Um, so you wanna make sure that's there. Check for exposed electrical wiring or exposed fuse box connectors. Obviously electrical hazards can cause fires. That's a big concern. Make sure you double check before you um, decide to sign in. And then checking for rodents or insects that are already present. You know, if there's evidence that's already there when it's empty, when you're looking at the apartment, it's likely only to get worse once someone moves in and brings food. Um, so you want to, if you see the signs, be wary. Here's just a few photos of evidence. Um, on the top left, we have some evidence of what lead paint looks like. So. That's something to keep in mind. Um, and, you know, evidence showing that there had been water leaks in the past under the sink. Um, then we have some evidence of insects and rodents and, um, you know, the stains of water damage on the ceiling. Um, the water damage one, I think, especially for the ceiling, if it looks small, don't assume that it's already fixed. You can ask the landlord about these things when you're going through the apartment. Um, it's important to know because it could very well get worse. If it's just starting, it's likely to get worse. You know, they may say it's already fixed. If it is, great, but you want to double check. And then I uh, thought, again, especially with the older singles and doubles that are so common around Buffalo, it's not just what's on the inside of the apartment. The exterior conditions can affect you um, a lot. Lead paint isn't just present inside, it's present outside. Um, and I'm sure people plan, especially those with younger kids, are gonna spend some time outside, either on the front porch or side yard, something, um, where chipping and peeling paint, if it's on the outside, can affect the health of that child. So keep that in mind. Um, lead testing kits are relatively affordable. It, it, shouldn't it shouldn't be up to the tenant ultimately to, to do these tests. 
but if you're finding an apartment that you plan to live in for a long time, it may be a worthwhile investment to to buy the kit just to protect you and your family safety. Um, like I said, you, you can get them for about $20 from Home Depot um, or any sort of hardware store. Um, and then also the health department can do testing for lead as well. They will send out inspectors if there's evidence of chipping and peeling paint. Um, another thing is to check for different rodent hazards. Um, if the backyard is filled with trash and debris, that can be a, a breeding ground for rodents. And often it's only a matter of time that they're in the yard right behind, they're gonna go searching for food and that house um, that the yard's behind is gonna be one of the first places they look. So if you see holes on the outside of the building, that's a way for them to get in. And if you see, you know, a lot of trash in the backyard or in the yard next door, that's definitely going to make it a bigger risk of rodents being able to get in. Um, so I think all of these are important things to think of before renting an apartment. You know, you obviously people who are on limited incomes are, have a hard time finding apartments that are affordable to rent and that are in great condition. But, you know, trying to find an apartment that you can happily move into that doesn't have many conditions present is, is gonna help out in the long run because while we do a lot of work here at MLS to try and get conditions fixed for tenants who are already in place, um, it's often an uphill battle and having, moving into an apartment that's already safe and secure is gonna go a long way. I would um, also add in when you're looking at the apartments for like the rodent problems, the basement a lot of times the basement has the holes so you may not initially see them on the outside but when you go deep into the basement you may find holes and areas there that you don't see on the outer perimeter of the house where they may be getting in and out and so another question would be like how most recently like how recently have you patched up the basement or you know if it's furnished when was this done you know when was this carpet placed with all these things because rodents will typically get in through the basement, not just the outside of the house, and then work their way up. Um, so you won't always see them just in the apartment or on the outer exterior of the home. The attic and the basement are definitely places you want to ask to see for any type of pest problems as well. Exactly. It goes beyond just the unit. You really want to check the common areas. Um, you know, if there's a broken window in the back hall, you might not think too much of it when you're saying, I'm not gonna spend any time in that back hall that just is shared between the two units. But come winter time and you're wondering where all of your heat goes, it might be the broken window in the back hall. So you really gotta look at all of the parts of, of the home that you can, especially with the older homes. Um, and like I said, the basement, it could be a source of a lot of different problems. Um, oftentimes when you're in the basement, you can see different electrical hazards. Um, and, and things like that that you might not see in the unit. Um, and Evidence again, of flooding? Yes, absolutely. Evidence of flooding in the basement as well um, is another thing. Because if you're looking at an apartment in the summer and, you know, it's relatively dry around, you know, you may not have anything to worry about. But then if you're not paying attention for it, you haven't looked, you haven't thought about whether the basement floods or not. Come fall, winter, and spring, we get a lot of snow and rain and the snow melts, your basement will back up. And that could lead to a lot of the electrical problems and even and even not electrical, just a smell. You know what I mean? Like no yeah. one would want their home to smell. Especially something that's not their fault that they can't control. You definitely don't want to deal with that uh, that stench around whether it's having company or just your day to day life living in that unit. So water damage in like a basement might be something else to look at. So I wanted to pose a question in the group. Um, is there anything you've ever missed when looking through an apartment that if you saw on day one could have saved you a headache later on? I would just want I to talk. Like 
Yeah, I was going to say, I went to, to an apartment uh, oh, it was a couple of years ago, and uh, the it was already going on dusk, so it was getting darker. And I told the landlord, can you turn on the light? Because I'd like to see the apartment in the light. And he goes, oh, well, you know, the electricity is off because obviously nobody's living here. And uh, he left it at that. And I was like, how do you show an apartment like that? So I had a flashlight and I turned it on and there were roaches all over. They started to scatter. So if they tell you that uh, the electricity isn't turned on, tell them you want to see the apartment when, when, when the lights are on. Or when it's daylight, so I kind of almost missed it because I carried a uh, flashlight that day. And it sounds like a flashlight could be good for other things as well, you know, under the sink, dark corners, mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking for rodent droppings. Yeah, I think everybody should go uh, equipped with something like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Not only flashlights, I know we discussed, um, you can buy outlet testers, um, again, from Home Depot or something. Obviously, they can be an expense, but I, I think they're around $20 or less. Um, but these are things that can help you double check things that you might not be able to see with your eyes. Because it, it goes beyond just being able to, to see things. There are a lot of hidden hazards in apartments. That yeah, are uh, very hard to find. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you can't necessarily you can't necessarily cover everything. Just as you know, for instance, if you have a sink like or a countertop that's like tile instead of one solid piece, um, pieces mm -hmm. of tile around the sink that are like coming up would be entrance yeah. ways for things like roaches, um, mm -hmm. potentially mice, um, and so on and so forth. To where like if you see that some of the tiles are like propped up your best bet would be to ask the landlord like if he can if he or she can like fix those and like have them set mm -hmm. back down properly again um so that way you can try and avoid pests getting onto your countertop through those cracks in the tiles which is something that most people may not think of if they've never had tile mm -hmm. for their countertop they may have had tile in their bathroom floor um and that's maybe about it and they've always had like solid wood or like some type of like solid granite for their kitchen countertop and so it's one of those things that people might not think of because they've never had to ask that question before. there's a lot of like smaller little details just in like the design of an apartment and what re um what materials are used that could lead to other questions later um like lazy susans they're a little harder to check because you can't really get all the way in the back too easily and so on and so forth and so just like the little uh um, eccentric aspects of housing that you know sometimes people don't realize to ask about or to check thoroughly is the landlord responsible for i know he's responsible for making sure that there are um uh, fire alarms whatever you call it i forget the names <laughs> fire detectors smoke detectors but are they responsible for co2 or is that the is that the uh the renter. Your landlord should have a working carbon monoxide detector installed. Um, okay. My understanding is it's not required to be in every room like smoke detectors, but I believe mm -hmm. it's every floor. Oh, okay, okay, good. Okay. Yeah, so, and typically the CO, if there's like a CO2 detector, you would typically want those to be in the kitchen where the mm -hmm. gas comes in at because of the oven you know it would make more sense to have it in the kitchen because that's more likely where gas is going to come from than anywhere else in the um apartment and so if there isn't a co2 detector you know the recommendation would be to tell the landlord you need one and to have it put somewhere near like in the kitchen and if there is one i would ask them to place one in the kitchen as well because that's the great risk of carbon dioxide and monoxide poisoning. I would like to say though, while the landlord is, it's their responsibility to get that carbon monoxide detector in, if you feel there's a gas leak present, it is definitely important to act quickly um, and either call National uh, Fuel, call the Health Department or Building Inspector, sometimes even the Fire Department may be appropriate if the other agencies aren't responding. Um, and potentially even purchase a carbon monoxide detector yourself. 
Um, while it is an expense, um, again, I, I believe they can be had for 20 to $30 for the most part uh -huh. to get a carbon monoxide detector. And that can be something that can be very unhealthy, you know, um, that exactly. you can risk death if you don't know that it's present. So while it, the landlord should be handling it, sometimes you just have to ultimately take the matter into your own hands to protect your own health if no one else is gonna, gonna do it. Exactly. Um, something that I wanted to put out there that people should be looking out for, uh, do not trust wall paneling or drop ceilings. I've yeah. personally gotten burned on both of those. So, and, and uh, especially when it comes to basements, because that, as you pointed out, water damage, uh, especially in basement walls, that could be a sign of a very serious issue in the basement and people will do whatever they can to hide those issues. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, sometimes even just, you know, it's worth wondering why one ceiling is painted and one ceiling tile looks brand new and the others aren't. Um, asking landlords and trusting your gut is often a good, good, um, you know, rule of thumb. If you feel like the landlord's dancing around your question about why won't you let me see the basement? There's probably a reason why you, you mm -hmm. feel like they're dancing around the question. And you may want to trust your gut and think he's hiding something from me that if I see, I'm not going to want to rent the apartment. Does anyone else have any questions or anything else that they want to add for um, things to look out for when looking at an apartment? The only thing I can think of is the quality of your door leading into your apartment or house. You know, that it has good locks on it, that is not a piece of plywood with uh, a lock and a, and, um, and handles put on it, but a, a door that secures interest to your residence. Absolutely. Um, you know, not only just the door to your apartment, but the door to the exterior. You want to make sure that they're going to keep you secure um, in the unit and that no one's going to be able to come in if they're not welcome. Um, and, and one thing I would also like to add is um, you know, sometimes landlords will say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z before you move in. Um, often smaller items, it's fine to, to trust them. If they're saying, I just am going to, you know, get the carpets clean and, and patch up this little bit of paint. Um, that's a much easier thing to follow through. If your landlord's promising you 30 different things and saying that you can move in three days from now, that's again, something to be wary of. Um, if he's saying, I'm, I'm going to, you know, replace the roof, install a new furnace, patch the ceiling, replace the carpets, put in a new bathroom, all in four days, it's not going to happen. So um, sometimes you do have to use your, your judgment of whether or not a landlord is being truthful when renting out the apartment, because it's important to remember their goal is to get someone in to start paying rent. Um, so you want to make sure that you take everything they're saying with a, a with a grain of salt. Anyone else have anything else they want to add? But um, if not, you and you think of something later on, you can bring it up at the end. We'll have a time for questions, but I think we're going to move on to um, lead paint issues. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, so like Jack was talking about before, um, in 1978, some protections went into effect um, concerning lead-based paint. So housing built before that time, um, you have to be particularly careful um, looking out for signs of lead-based paint. Um, things like paint chips and even dust from the paint that collects um, in your home or outside your home, like Jack mentioned before, um, can be especially harmful to young children. Um, but, but there's no level of lead anywhere that would be safe in terms of exposure to anybody. Um, when a landlord rents out an apartment that was built before 1978, um, they do have to inform tenants about known um, lead paint in the unit. 
there should be something um, warning tenants about lead in the lease and the tenant should get information about lead um, as well. And we'll have, uh, there's a sample lead-based paint disclosure in a couple of slides. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, okay, we're on the second one now. Um, so almost all rental housing is covered under this. There are some exceptions. Um, housing built after 1978 should not have lead-based paint um, in it, so that housing is not covered. Um, housing, certain housing um, like dorm rooms or um, rooming houses, things like that, where there's just single rooms um, may not be covered. Um, housing that's designated specifically for elderly people that doesn't have children living there um, may not be covered. And then housing that has been um, inspected by someone certified to do so and certified not to have lead in it um, is also not covered. But generally speaking, most housing is. I'm just going to jump in for a second. So we have a lot of reasons to be proud that we live in Buffalo, but the fact that we lead the nation in terms of the number of children who are lead poisoned is not a reason for pride. Um, and a lot of it's not our fault, right? We live in housing that's old. Um, some of the housing in our communities hasn't been kept up and old paint when it chips off the wall, it's easy for little kids to get it in their mouths. But um, lead poisoning calls, causes permanent damage in children. Um, it's not good for anyone, but for kids under six, it's, it's really bad. And also for women who are pregnant, because um, if their bodies absorb it, they can pass it on to their children. So, um, you know, especially if you're looking for housing and, and you have small children in, in your household, you know, people, small people under the age of six, um, this is something you should really keep an eye out for because it can be a, a lifelong problem. So up is an example of the disclosure form that landlords are required to give you under the law if the apartment's applicable. Um, one thing we did want to, you know, point out is this would be something that they check if they have knowledge of lead paint. That doesn't mean that lead paint is not present. So if you get one that says the lesser has no knowledge of lead-based paint, that means they've never had a positive test, they've never had the health department come by to look at it and say that there's lead paint, but it may still be present. So you do have to be wary and keep your eyes out, peeled mm -hmm. for lead-based hazards. Um, and like I said, sometimes you may choose to pay to, to do your own test just to make sure that there isn't lead in the home and that your children can be safe. Does anyone have any questions about um, the lead disclosure rules or lead-based? Yeah, yeah uh, this is Jim. So you said if, if it's known to be present, and let's say the landlord doesn't know it's present, mm -hmm. and you come in, you take the apartment, then later on you discover that it is, uh, there, that lead is right there in, in where you're at. Um, where does the liability lie with the landlord or is there any liability? It would depend on a lot of factors, but, but one of the factors is, did the landlord know? And once the landlord knew, what did the landlord do in terms of correcting the problem? So, um, you know, I, I think like, Lots of us in Buffalo, we've learned to identify lead paint, right? So we talk about like, if it looks like uh, crocodile skin, if it's crocodiling, um, then, then that could be lead paint. Um, but that doesn't mean, like when they say no, they mean like, did a third party that did a lead test tell you that there's lead in that paint? Um, but, but once a landlord knows in that sense of the word, if the landlord doesn't do anything, you know, then the landlord could be held liable. Hmm. Okay, I guess uh, I, I I see what you're saying. I'm I'm wondering, then does that open up? Uh, let's say a person moves in, landlord didn't know. Um, Make your computer easier to use. 
Make your computer easier to use. Make your computer easier to use. I don't know who that Wait. is. Yeah, I'm gonna try to find out. But if it's if you know it's you, if you could mute, that would be great. Oh, uh, uh, I, I was wondering, like, so if someone went in, uh, landlord didn't know. They went in. Someone not it got discovered because somebody somehow gets sick. Um, uh, it just seemed like, uh, in one way, if in these times where landlords know they have a building older than that age, uh, which uh, it is sort of like the marking line, that it would seem like it would be due diligence. Uh, it would be a failure of due diligence on the part of a landlord to make sure their building is safe. So. Anyway, that's what I was just thinking about. Oh, well, you make a good point. And I, I think, you know, if there's paint just sort of peeling off the walls, that's one situation. But children often get lead poisoned um, because, you know, you could have an apartment that's really nicely painted, let's say. But every time you open and you close the door, it's there's like friction. The door is rubbing and that could create lead dust and a child could get poisoned, you know, with that. So, so yeah if the apartment's in really bad shape there's a possibility you could say look this was a home that was built in the 1920s and you know look at the paint peeling off that wall but but even in situations where the paint looks good um there could just be a corner of the house where there's a lot of lead dust on the floor and you know if the landlord didn't know that there was lead dust on the floor then probably the landlord wouldn't be considered uh may not be considered I, I don't want to say definitely but may not be considered responsible if there were if the landlord had no knowledge so in the interest of uh time i think we're going to move on to the uh covid19 section and just go over um the ever-changing landscape of housing and covid19 So I just want to emphasize, um, like Jack said, um, and I'm sure as everyone is aware, things have been changing very quickly over the past couple of months. Um, I think there's a lot of um, confusion right now and um, different interpretations of what might be happening. But we wanted to share with you um, some information that comes directly from Governor Cuomo um, and then also some information from the Attorney General's office. Um, so at this point in time, Governor Cuomo, on, on Governor Cuomo's website, um, there's a quote listed here, uh, as well as the link to the site. Um, the site does say that Cuomo announced the state's moratorium on COVID-related residential or commercial evictions will be extended um, for an additional 60 days until August 20th. Um, additionally, the Attorney General's website states that beginning on March 20th of this year, all evictions across the state are suspended until August 20th. Um, and no, um, no civil officer who is able to um, execute a warrant of eviction is able to do so until August 20th. Um, so that being said, um, it's it's a good idea if anyone has specific questions to contact Neighborhood Legal Services. We can give you more specific advice based on your own circumstances. Um, also important to note, like I said before, um, orders to vacate due to unsafe conditions in a unit are still in effect, um, can still go into effect during the moratorium. Um, and again, um, our phone number is down on the bottom of this slide if anyone has specific questions about um, what's going on with evictions and how that specifically pertains to you. Um, Grace, is there anything else you wanted to add on this? We've got just the, uh, the second slide after this. Right, I, ju I just wanted to say, you know, not to be frightened by the last thing about the orders to vacate. You know, those are real extreme situations. So if you had no water, um, if there were, uh, I don't know, flames shooting out of your electrical sockets, um, you know, in that situation, I think there could be a chance that uh, order to vacate could issue. But I think the authorities know that people are sheltering at home right now. And so there's like that balance between um, making sure that people have a place to be and also not wanting to uh, expose anyone to really unsafe conditions. Um, I think we can just go to the next slide. Thank you. 
Um, so concerning housing conditions specifically, um, like we said before, the Erie County Health Department and the Buffalo Building Inspectors are still um, doing inspections um, for emergencies, and that's determined on a case-by-case -case basis by the agency. Um, in Erie County, uh, the courts are still only hearing essential cases, and right now they're not hearing any um, eviction matters. Um, if you do have any concerns about how to address conditions in your home while the courts are not hearing non-essential cases, um, you can contact our offices and the phone number is there, 847-0650. Um, if you are receiving Section 8 rental assistance, each of the housing choice providers um, in the city of Buffalo, those are um, Rental Assistance Corporation, Belmont, and Buffalo Municipal Housing Authority. Um, they've each adapted differently to um, the challenges of COVID-19 and how they're handling inspections. So it's important to communicate with your housing specialist at your Section 8 um, uh, your Section 8 uh, provider. And also, if you have any issues with that, um, you can contact Neighborhood Legal Services and we can look into that and try to assist. Yeah. Um, relating to COVID and housing, um, Adam posed a good point on what I was going to say with the eviction moratorium. Um, it is important to note the wording of the expansion that up until the, the additional 60 days until August 20th, that is only for non-payment. So that part of the eviction moratorium, the extension is protecting people from non-payment of rent because of the financial hardship of COVID-19, but it is not the same as the full-on moratorium we have had so far. Um, so I think there's some lack of clarity around that. And right now, Neighborhood Legal Services is taking the position that um, all evictions are suspended. And so if somebody um, is in a situation where the landlord is trying to evict them, at this point, until there's any further guidance, we would actually go to court and try to stop that eviction. Um, and so as Alyssa mentioned earlier, you know, the court is only open for essential matters, but we got assurance from Buffalo City Court that an essential matter would include um, an eviction if it were if it was an illegal eviction um, and also bad housing conditions but right now we're taking the position that that all evictions are suspended and and I know that there's been some um, back and forth on that but um, you know the governor's web website and the attorney general's office seems to be supporting that as well And like I said, we do have a training coming up in two weeks. Um, as more information comes out, we will certainly be checking in um, and providing you as frequently as possible as it gets closer and closer to the June 20th date and then the August 20th date on exactly what position the courts are taking and what information our office has gotten. Does anyone have any other questions um, about the COVID-19 impact, but also about um, what we've covered tonight in general? Well, I just want to take a moment to just go over um, the different services, neighborhood legal services does provide for the community. Um, I have our phone number up here on the screen, 716-847-0650. Um, um, you know, we cover landlord-tenant law, we represent tenants um, in all sorts of landlord-tenant cases. We also have a disability unit that helps with people who are having issues related to SSI and SSD. Um, we have a family unit that can help out with divorces, orders of protection, and other custody matters. Um, a public benefits unit that covers public benefits food stamps, emergency shelter, um, and heat issues. We have people who help you when searching for health insurance, um, navigators who can help you with the New York State of Health and Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and we also have an organization that helps for people who are on disability programs that are looking to get back into work and um, how to navigate the complicated problems there where it can affect your benefits. Um, so if you are having any sort of legal issues or you know anyone who is, um, there are income criteria that we have for um, most of these programs. Some 
do not have any income limits, but feel free to give us a call or um, shoot me an email and I can connect you guys to the right place. On the last slide, I'm gonna have my email address. Um, Angel, do you wanna cover some of the things that pushed us? So, Buffalo is a very large organization. And so we have currently a COVID mutual aid hub, um, you know, that people can donate to. Um, we're taking donations of food, donations of money, um, in order to try and serve the community from that, from the gym. And um, we've been giving away food um, to different communities and to different community members. Um, we are an affordable housing organization. We do own a myriad of properties around the west side and are, you know, constantly working on updating um, certain aspects of ones. And um, we, you know, we buy new properties and rehab them. Um, and we have our affordable housing which goes by state guidelines. We have our organizing department, which has a climate organizer, um, the housing organizer position, um, as well as a street team. And so we work on a myriad of issues of like state, local, and federal climate legislation and campaigns, housing, as well as doing um, voter awareness and voter registration efforts. Um, so for currently our street team, which is our voting, we want to do the voter efforts, are spreading information about um, absentee ballots and how people can sign up for one so that way they still get the chance to vote come June. And hopefully it won't be necessary, but if needed, come November by absentee ballot. We do have our tenant advocate who, is, who should be on the call, I believe named Amina. She might have left, but Amina Johnson is our tenant advocate. She works with a lot of our tenants um, when they're having issues in the home and like as a mediator between the tenant and our you know housing department who like actually handles the stuff as well as taking on um, as a consultant to members of the community from time to time um, helping be an advocate for tenants across we have a section called Push Green, which works very close with NYSERDA. Um, they're kind of like a middleman between NYSERDA and the community. And so what Push Green does is it consult, it talks to people and kind of asks them about their situation and sees what programs they might qualify for through NYSERDA, um, which can range anywhere from like energy audits to like weatherization of homes um, and so on and so forth. So they kind of like, do the research to know what programs are out there to then give that in information to the community so that the community can take advantage um, of these programs from a centralized place that has the information because the information is not always easy to come across even if you're looking for it actively and then our other one is the department of new economy which is constantly looking at you know cooperative business models and new economic systems and on how um, we can better run our communities in an economic sense in a shared sense um, and how that might look in the future and how to transition to that to that future um, and so yeah, push buffalo like i said is a very large organization with a lot of different moving pieces um and so it's, it's sometimes very confusing and Anybody who does want to know more about these, I'm sure you have a lot of questions because there is a lot of work and intricacies that go into it. Um, and so the number is 716-884-0356. Um, you can also email me. I'll put my email in the chat um, and then I can direct you, you know, where to whatever department or whatever you know, person you may need to be in touch with that you're curious about, I can direct you that way. So yeah, I'll put my th information in the chat now. And you forgot got push silver. <laughs> and we have, yep, and there is push silver. I, you know, that's my mistake, which is our group of elders who have been advocating for our community and showing up to our meetings and our rallies and helping us write our campaigns up and think of things and they're the elders who have been here long before us and who have made all the work we do possible 
Yes, we advocate for them. We give the elders a voice. We help the seniors who live upstairs on the second and third floor of the push building because they're senior housing and uh, people that are disabled there. So we try to help them to advocate for them and to kind of refer them to things that they need. So like Ang has said, there's a lot that goes on in push. I don't think there's anything that they don't touch. And if you want to know, hit Angela. Yep, I'm here. So I think that just about covers everything. We did go a little, we did go past seven, but we also started after six. <laughs> so I think overall we went, we went well on time and I appreciate everybody for being here, taking part in this, and you know, for the people asking questions like Jim and Adam, you know, and just helping this be a you know more interactive process. And we will be doing more trainings on other aspects of housing coming forward. This is just the first in a series of trainings that are going to be happening every two weeks. So I just uh, dropped the Google Drive again in the chat for anyone uh, to take a look. We'll try and get that information out um, on our social media as well. So people can check in there. Um, like Angel said, we're doing a training. It's going to be basically every other Friday for uh, the next several weeks. So we have got five. This is only number one in a series of five. So we hope to see um, people coming back and some new faces. So if you have any friends, feel free to invite them. Um, and it'll be the same Zoom call. So the same Zoom link and the same Zoom phone number and ID and everything like that. Um, so feel free to ask any more questions or drop any more in the chat um, and we'll stick around for a little bit longer but feel free to sign off as well. <laughs> Jack, do you want to say something about the feedback form? Oh yes, um, if you can please on the drive um, there is a feedback form um, to answer a few questions uh, about the training and help us improve the future trainings, you know, what you guys want to hear and the upcoming trainings. Um, also to share your email address. Um, if you guys are able to share your information, um, if you are interested, especially in being a community tenant advocate in the long term, um, we're gonna be holding trainings when things open back up and it becomes safe to do so to train community members to help advocate for their neighbors. Um, and we wanna get as many people who are interested um, their information so we can reach out to them when the time comes where it's safe to provide those trainings. So you can email on how um, If you aren't able to get on the Google Drive form, you can drop it in the chat. You can email me at um, jvest at nls.org. Um, or if you reach out and um, to our phone number and dial two, uh, 276 is my extension, you can leave me a message with your information. Um, really, however you can, we'd, we'd love to hear from you if you're interested in being a tenant advocate in the future, or if you just want to get information about the trainings that we have coming up. Um, however, you can reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I think it went well. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank Stay you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you